Some have argued that good governance is too high a set of ideals for countries and that we can be satisfied with good enough governance. The truth is, in today's society, good governance is really driven by people's expectations. And it is the people's expectation which we must honor. If there is no demand for good governance, there's likely, there's hardly likely to have a good supply of good governance. And in today's world, in which our society has become even more sensitive to the way in which the public affairs are managed, there is an increasing demand for good governance, which indeed places the yardstick against which we must supply that good governance. And today, you will be discussing how that good governance in the corporate sector of the state enterprise could improve the delivery that is required of you by the society, that will enhance the capacity to so do, that will at the same time ensure that there is accountability, that you make the right public choices, and that you operate with the highest level of efficiency. Those are the various components of corporate good governance that we'll be focusing upon during the course of the day by many who have specialized in these areas, but now you're all specialists in your specific responsibility. The Permanent Secretary quickly outlined the role of the corporate soul, corporation soul. It is a constitutionally appointed position and requires the Minister of Finance, whoever he or she may be, to take full responsibility for the way in which the assets of the state through the corporations that have been established are effectively managed. And as was, as was pointed out, there is dual responsibility between the line minister and the Minister of Finance on these matters. What are the expectations for the corporation soul in the discharge of this constitutionally subscribed duty? The first expectation is that in the final analysis, I and through, through myself, with your support, we are accountable to Parliament. The Parliament is the institution to whom we account for our performance, our outcomes, as well as for our plans for the future. So the first expectation is accountability to Parliament. The second expectation has to do with the adherence to government policy. In each area, there is a prescribed policy framework, much of which is being developed by yourselves, but in the final analysis, there must be a clear policy direction. The third expectation has to do with measuring performance outcomes. And I use the word outcomes deliberately and distinct from the word output. For in today's nomenclature on management, the issue of outcomes is what we measure. Outcomes is what benefit it brings to the society. And the fourth expectation is that we must all comply with what we call acceptable public values, 
in the discharge of our duty. Those are the expectations that form the demand for good governance and the responsibility of all of us to discharge in accordance with these broad expectations. In order to be able to perform the functions to discharge these expectations of a modern society in the modern time, there are a number of functional requirements. The first has to do with the question of using the public office which you hold to create opportunities for adding value to the society and ensuring that we can stand the test of competitiveness against established benchmarks, whether those ben benchmarks are of a local nature, a regional nature, or an international nature. So that's one of the functions that we must embark upon on a day-to-day -day basis. And chairmen of the board are charged with the responsibility to provide the leadership so that these this particular objective can be achieved. The second function is to enhance shareholder value. And I use the word shareholder value deliberately in order to incorporate the public interests as well as the interests of the owners of the shares, which essentially is the government operating on behalf of the people. Enhancing shareholders' value, therefore, is one of your major functions that must be performed. And the third one that sometimes we have been loosely adhering to is now the complete financial accountability of state enterprises. And during the course of today, I'm sure you will go into the details of the demands of financial accountability. The corporation's soul is largely responsible for financial accountability, whereas the line ministers are responsible for the wider operations of the company. A brief assessment of the metrics of the state enterprise sector would suggest that it is significant in Trinidad and Tobago. And by the state enterprise sector, I include the Special Purposes Committee, but we exclude the statutory bodies on the basis of the data I will now share with you. If we were to include it, then of course, it will show an even more pronounced role of the state sector. The total annual revenue of the state sectors defined in the way I have defined it is in the vicinity of $48 billion. The overall profit is in the vicinity of $3 billion. The total dividends that are paid to the Treasury is in the order of $1.2 billion. The total assets of the order of $120 billion. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago equity is in the order of $7 billion. The number of persons employed is 16,000. And the total debt of state enterprises is 13 billion dollars. These metrics which I have outlined merely signal the fact that this is a significant sector. And underlying the size of this sector is the role of the state in economic development. And I will say just a few words on that before I end. What are some of the operating principles that will guide us in the discharge 
of this duty on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. In the first instance, there is what we call a performance monitoring manual, which I know has been circulated to you with some revisions that we have made within the last few months. To some extent, the, oper the performance monitoring manual is the framework within which your operating decisions are to be made and must be consistent with. And within the context of the performance manual, there is what is referred to as a project management protocol. The performance manual, monitoring manual, represents the framework for the oversight of state enterprise sector. It is important to note that the manual highlights standard procurement procedures. It also establishes guidelines to facilitate the state with information on expenditure, communication, and reporting on actual performance of the enterprise as well as its strategic plans and proposals for significant capital expenditure. Within this context, there is, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the project management protocol, which focuses on ensuring that the infrastructure projects are effectively managed against benchmarks that have been agreed upon and standards that have been settled by the relevant authority in the government to ensure that there is a reduction in cost overruns and to ensure that there is high quality in the product. 